the engineers had to conjure a bastion of empire from crumbling gravel and sand. What they built was a masterpiece of military engineering, a fort within a fort, double protection for the defenders, and double trouble for invaders. Anyone who entered had to navigate a daunting maze of gates and passageways, towers and walls, a Chinese puzzle designed to confuse attackers. No wonder the Ming emperors called this place the strongest fortress under heaven. No one ever captured it. No one even tried. The cost would have been far too high. Even tourists can pick off targets from the battlements. Professional soldiers could slaughter anyone who attacked. But Jiayu Guan needed more than a clever layout to make it strong. Earlier dynasties had built massive walls in this desert using what nature provided, soil, sand, gravel, and reeds. But by the 15th century, the Ming and their enemies were fighting with far deadlier weapons. Like some of the world's earliest artillery. So Jiayu Guan needed something much tougher than clay and gravel. Again, the fort builders met the challenge with a brilliantly simple solution. They still relied on local clay and gravel to build their walls, but covered them with multiple layers of densely packed bricks, baked hard in the desert sun, and they made sure to build in arrow slits to discourage tampering. Jiayu Guan was a triumph, but it still stood alone on the western border, far from any other garrisons. Unless its commander could signal for help, attackers might still overwhelm it and threaten all of western China. The answer was blowing in the wind. Ming military planners perfected the imperial smoke signaling system. Jiayu Guan's commander could send a message to Beijing, 1,200 miles away, in just one day. By the early 1600s, the Great Wall was stronger than ever. But the dynasty that had invested so much in it was starting to crumble. The Ming Empire was in turmoil. And soon, nobody in the capital would be returning calls from the frontier forts. By the early 17th century, the Great Wall of China had become the world's most formidable system of defense. Faced with the terrifying threat of Mongol invasions, the Ming emperors had spent three centuries reinforcing their northern frontier. They armored earthen walls with brick to withstand cannonballs and catapults, and equipped their troops with the most lethal weapons of their time. The Great Wall should have kept the Ming in power forever. But the great fortifications had a fatal weakness, one the emperors hadn't counted on. One of the main problems of walls is that they were often overcome because of subversion. Nomadic people offered great incentives to anyone who would defect and in fact promised to spare the lives of people who would surrender. Shanghai Guan on the Yellow Sea. This wide coastal plain had always been an easy road to riches for marauding horsemen. General Qi Ji Guan had solved the problem by building an impenetrable barrier. But now, the Ming Dynasty was in its death throes. Taxed to the limit to pay for the Great Wall, the peasants rose up in revolt. And a northern tribe called the Manchu launched an invasion down the coastal strip. When they reached Shanghai Guan, its massive defenses halted their advance. Inside, the Chinese watched and waited. Then the garrison commander made a decision that changed the course of Chinese history. He threw open the gates and joined forces with the Manchu to crush the peasant uprising. The world's most sophisticated fortifications were abandoned. 
Soon, they'd be almost forgotten. Their brutal history mixing with myth and legend. But the Chinese people know that many of the wall's darkest stories are painfully true. Countless numbers of their ancestors paid for the Great Wall with their sweat and blood. They've come to see it as a symbol of nationhood, and they're working hard to preserve it. Machines can perform some of the ancient tasks, but the sheer scale of the project is staggering. Shanghai Guan has four gates. The only one that's in good condition is the East Gate, the first pass under heaven. We're currently restoring the West Gate. It will take a team of 50 about seven months to complete. Repairs in just our conservation area, only one and a half square kilometers, will cost a quarter of a billion dollars. The walls made of tamped earth will take even longer to fix because there are no shortcuts. The only way to do it is how they've always done it. There's no way you can use a machine to build this type of wall. The soil is dry. It can't be piled up. So the method we use is the ancient one that's been passed down to us. Of course, the material isn't expensive. It's just soil. But labor costs are high because all the earth has to be carried up on the backs of people. The defensive walls across northern China are on a scale that dwarfs every other construction on Earth. Through all kinds of terrain, beneath the sea, over jagged mountain ranges, into unforgiving deserts, the wall builders faced endless challenges and found ingenious ways to overcome them. The Great Wall is a remarkable edifice and a testament to human achievement and to organization, the ability to draw men together, whether willingly or not, and far exceeds any such accomplishment in the West, including the Egyptian ability to create the Great Pyramids. It was essential to make the wall stronger because this was not a conflict that lasted 10 years or 100 years. It was a protracted and violent cultural conflict. As they fought off terrifying enemies over 20 centuries, the Chinese perfected the art of war and the science of defense. They developed many of the technologies we still use in construction today. But they paid a terrible price, suffering on a scale we can barely comprehend. So if the Great Wall symbolizes anything, it's China's determination to survive, whatever the cost.